This video is brought to you by Squarespace, an all-in-one platform for building a brand and growing your business online. Hello, my beautiful doves. Um, <laughs> I just recorded this entire video and I realized my mic wasn't synced up. So now I'm redoing this entire thing, which is totally fine. I don't know if you've noticed, but I'm in a completely different background. And I know I've been teasing out this like, I'm moving to a new apartment thing for my last two videos, but I'm actually not in New York right now. I'm in California because most of my family lives in California and I'm here for the holidays. And so this is my cousin's beautiful wall that I'm sitting in front of today. <laughs> so for today's video, we're gonna be talking about is skinny back in. If you're on the internet at all, which you are because you're watching this video, um, you're probably under the Kardashian sphere of influence. I hate to break it to you. And earlier this year, there were a bunch of conspiracy theories about how Kim and Khloe Kardashian reversed their BBLs, thus signaling the turning point in women's body trends. Now curvy is out and thin is back in. I don't wanna fully blame the Kardashians per se, though I think Kim bragging about how she lost 16 pounds in a month to fit in the Marilyn Monroe dress to her millions upon millions of followers is tremendously irresponsible to say the least. But you know, it's also no surprise that Y2K has been having a major fashion comeback for some years now, and the prevalence of low-waist miniskirts and pants on the market has brought back flat torso glorification. So for this video, I want to explore how 90s body trends have affected today's body trends because I've noticed that a lot of publications who've been discussing the thin is back trend have referenced 90s heroin chic. So I, I do want to talk about that. And then we're also going to be talking about whether or not this veering towards the skinny is something that's actually happening or if it's just mass hysteria. Let's get into it after today's sponsor. Thank you Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Squarespace is a great platform to help you build the website of your dreams for both desktop and mobile optimization. They have tons of pre-made templates and extra customization options that are easy to use, no HTML training needed. To aid you in growing your business, Squarespace offers these analytic breakdowns so you can see who's checking you out and for how long they're spending on your page. If you're running a business like a yoga studio, a hair salon, or any type of consultation service, Squarespace makes it super easy for your clients to book appointments. Check out squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. So heroin chic, which I will be now dubbing as hero chic to avoid the censors, started off as a photography trend. Um, it was championed by photographers like Corinne Day, David Sims, Craig McDean, and David Sorrenti. But we're going to go a little bit deeper first, uh, prior to the 90s, because to understand what hero chic is, we have to understand the symbolic representation of drugs in 20th century art. And by the way, I will be saying rugs from now on because censors, sorry if I'm being a little bit ridiculous with this coding, but uh, last month, my Tumblr girl video got age restricted, which basically means I don't get any more ad revenue from it, which is like fine, I guess, because it's been up for a while. But also what makes me sad is that people can't discover it anymore unless they are over the age of 18 and signed in to YouTube. In the 19th century, rugs were often associated with signs of weakness and therefore femininity. They could also be associated with Orientalism or just generalized exoticism of other cultures. For instance, artist Eugène Delacroix's painting Women of Algiers depicts these North African women lounging with hookah pipes. Rebecca Arnold writes, these women's indolent lifestyle was perceived as being in direct, if enticing, opposition to the morally contained and rational world of European males. And this painting further contributed to the mythology of the OP eater, reinforcing the notion of rug taking as a part of bohemian life, a signifier of artistic liberalism to those who indulged, and a dangerous subversion to the establishment. Painter Edgar Degas' 1876 work, Absinthe Drinker, shows the other side of rugs in art. The painting is drained of color and the woman in this painting, the addict, is numb and melancholy. Regardless of these differences, Arnold writes, the absinthe drinker and the OP eater both embodied 19th century fears of degeneration, the belief that a culture is apt to deteriorate over time, becoming corrupt and dissolute. 
In the 20th century, the demonization of rugs worsened as many soldiers on leave from the front of World War I started using. I mean, can anyone blame them? That sounded like a horrific place to be. But, you know, even though a good number of rugs were previously pretty easy to find, the predominant narrative now was that rug users were rug abusers, spiraling out of control. So in the 1960s and 70s, the U.S. was a mess in terms of moral certainty. Aside from the civil rights movement going on, people were upset under the strain of jobs and poor working conditions, and many felt dissatisfied with life, particularly those that lived in alienating cities. At the same time, a lot of companies were pushing out these luxurious ads, and many people were drawn into the allure of consumption. Some of this consumption was rug consumption because rugs offered uh, brief respites um, from modern society. Then in the 1980s, there was this fitness craze, so it comes to no surprise that fashion photography of the time period championed the healthy toned body with popular supermodels like Brooke Shields and Elle McPherson gracing the glossy pages. But this fashion imagery didn't mirror the attitudes of the youth. The U.S. entered a recession in 1990. College graduates were entering a deflated job market, which they blamed on the previous generation, the baby boomers. This created a sense of nihilism and pessimism among the youth. And needless to say, no one wanted to rock an 80s power suit anymore. Generation X craved something more authentic, which spawned an era of pop culture that obsessed over being real. Movements like punk, grunge, indie kids, and riot girl all rejected the yuppie materialism and the health and fitness craze of the 1980s. So it's no surprise that with these movements gaining fervor, um, legacy magazines like Vogue and Harper's Bazaar were losing their connection with the youth. So to fill that void, magazines like The Face, ID, and Detour propped up. These fashion magazines also hired up-and-coming photographers who shared a similar vision. Once again, they rejected the notion of 80s glamour and instead opted to show a truer image of reality. This perception that came through in their photography came to be called dirty realism. Dirty realism presented the bleakest aspects of reality, poverty, violence, self-destruction, banality, the morality of the body, you name it. This wasn't the first time, of course, that photographers worked with the subject matter. Um, in the mid-century, photographers Richard Avedon, Helmut Newton, and Guy Bourdin sought to break away from traditional magazine imagery and instead focused on violent, erotic, and fetishistic imagery. As fashion editor Laura Craig writes, they pushed the limits of fashion photography to produce images that shocked by questioning the foundations of fashion and making intertextual references to the other cultural debates. Arnold explains the appeal of dirty realism. The desire to experience danger excess, if only voyeuristically via the visual image, has power in a society constantly seeking a new thrill. These kinds of alternative representations mostly stayed in the pages of alternative magazines and indie art shows where they were readily accepted. But in 1993, photographer Corinne Day really shook up the table when she was hired by British Vogue. She shot Kate Moss in skimpy underwear in a pretty underwhelming setup when you look back at it from today's point of view. But at the time, it created a lot of public outcry, especially because all the other shoots that were featured in the magazine issue were, you know, the stereotypical, glossy, luxurious spreads. So this moment is what a lot of people consider to be the mainstream entry of Hero Chic, even though it doesn't really feel like that once you look at later um, photographs. For instance, Day's 1995 photograph, Regina Brixton, was actually way more in line with the typical hero chic genre. The photograph features a model in a claustrophobic, cheap, bland interior, and her body is contorted, her expression is confused, and the overall unkemptness implicates rug abuse. Despite this, Day has actually denied the label of hero chic because she has claimed that she has not been glamorizing anything, she's simply showing reality. Similarly, when Craig McDean shot the 1996 Jill Sanders spring summer campaign and catalog, model Genevieve Van Cenis was styled with messy knotted hair, clammy skin, and red-rimmed eyes. Sander defended this choice, saying, there is a generational change. We want to dress women in a way so they feel modern. I don't want them to look retro or 80s looks. I'm totally against it. It's too easy. When critics came after her for glamorizing rugs, she explained this makeup has nothing to do with the rug scene. It has something to do with sensitivity and refinement and going away from the old fashioned world. We are not in the old time. Sometimes you have to punch harder to go forward. We can't go back to the old idea of beauty. 
Similarly, former creative director of Culture Magazine Surface, Riley John Donnell said, what you're calling a hero look, we're calling a real look. Claiming sweaty is what someone can look like in their apartment in New York. A lot of these images are domestic, sitting in apartments, sitting on couches. It makes fashion more accessible. <laughs> I don't know. When I look at these images, I don't see anything particularly sinister. I also think it's just because fashion photography has developed so much over the years. Like people have gotten really editorial with their shoots. So something like this, once again, seems very tepid, but it was interpreted as being, you know, associated with this underground youth scene because these photographs differed so much from mainstream fashion photography. And there was this mass hysteria at the time. Vogue even published an article in 1994 about the media glamorization of drugs titled Under the Influence. So that definitely guided people into perceiving imagery a certain way. Also, if you remember, Hollywood was on this wave as well. Basketball Diaries, Pulp Fiction, and Train Spotting were all like major hits. But also in the mid 90s, there were these media publications that were confirming the rise of hero usage among middle to upper middle class suburban white teenagers. So when there's all these things going on at once, there is mass hysteria. And so it is way easier to look at this disheveled model and be like, yeah, she's part of the problem. I also think dirty realism as a genre is completely fine. I think it's very important to showcase both the positive and the negative aspects of humanity. But at the same time, I see what critics are saying because it's fashion photography. And in the realm of fashion photography, any subject matter is coded as glamorous and not just showing reality. Let me explain. The glamorization aspect comes from how, at the end of the day, these editorial photographs are meant to promote consumerism. At the end of the day, we perceive fashion photography differently than we perceive photojournalism. The underlying advertising aspect of fashion photography makes the hero chic genre feel exploitative and icky. Another major hero chic moment was when Calvin Klein pushed their CKB fragrance campaign. In this campaign, the models were described resembling teens waiting outside of a methadone clinic for their next fix. In a joint press release, anti-rug leaders charged that Klein had betrayed American parents' trust in a misguided and dangerous effort to glamorize hero addiction to appeal to adolescents. Further, they deemed the campaign obscene and even likened it to glamorizing cancer. Another problem with the genre is that it can be seen as exploitative of underprivileged youth. Cultural critic Henry A. Giraud argues that hero chic amounts to little more than cultural slumming as cheap titillation for its yuppie audience, whose members imagine themselves being reckless and edgy as they appropriate the behaviors, dress, discourse, and experiences of those who occupy the most tragic margins of society. So in the end, it's generally accepted that the trend came to a halt because of fashion photographer David Sorrenti's death in 1997. His cause of death was at first misreported as a hero overdose, and this incident confirmed the public's fears that hero use was on a dramatic rise and that hero chic imagery glamorized it. In May 1997, President Bill Clinton even condemned the fashion industry at a press conference. In the press in recent days, we've seen reports that many of our fashion leaders are now absolutely admitting, and I, I honor them for doing this, they're admitting flat out that images projected in fashion photos in the last few years have made addiction seem glamorous and sexy and cool. You do not need to glamorize addiction to sell clothes. Critics later claim that the fashion industry was used as a scapegoat for systemic problems, including Craig, who wrote, it is far easier to blame the fashion industry than to look at the cultural and sociological reasons for rug abuse. People take hero because they hate life and quite possibly hate themselves as well or because they have no money and no hope, or because they have everything but it still isn't enough, or because they are genetically predisposed to addiction, or because they hate it and can't stop, or because they like it and don't want to, not solely because they saw a model in a magazine who they thought looked cool. Over the years, the photography origins of hero chic has kind of been lost. Now people use it as a term to reference any kind of like skinny fashion look which is not like super far off because a lot of the models who are featured in this photography genre were 
very skinny. But I would argue that the skinny era didn't really reach its peak until after the hero chic era um, in the early 2000s. And I'm probably biased because I didn't really live through the 90s. I was like three years old in the 90s. But at least when looking at fashion trends of the era, a lot of 90s trends revolved around baggier fits. And so the thin body shape wasn't as intrusive in the mainstream. But in the 2000s, a lot of fashion trends, including micro mini skirts and baby tees, clearly championed a certain body type. Of course, anyone in theory can wear these kinds of garments, but tabloids insulting famous women for muffin tops, Hollywood movies and TV shows making fat phobic jokes, and magazines publishing numerous dieting guides created the narrative that if you didn't have a flat tummy, don't bother participating. Hero chic poster girl Kate Moss said it herself in 2009, nothing tastes as good as skinny feels. Though I do feel like I have to add that she did retract her statement 10 years later, but you get the gist of the era. A few months ago, The Cup published a bit of a mass hysteria article titled, Internet Thin Culture is Back. In it, they note Kim Kardashian's thinner body and her tummy tightening promotions, the variations of the 90s hero chic body becoming popular search terms on TikTok, Tumblr's pro Anna language migrating onto TikTok, the low rise whale tail trend, the Mew Mew mini skirt, shameless body checking on Maine, and the hashtag that girl lifestyle that revolves around green juice breakfast and 6 a.m. Pilates classes. They also reported how brands like Old Navy and Loft actually ditched their plus size collections earlier this year. And in a Refinery29 article, it was reported that only 10 of Madewell's 144 stores nationwide carry their plus-size line in all denim styles. Similarly, Reformation has been criticized for their lack of in-store plus-size offerings, showing once again how their fat customers are underprioritized. The Los Angeles Times also reported in 2021 that medical fat shaming increased during the pandemic and got in the way of proper care. Eating disorders have also been on the rise. And if any of you keep up with Dumois, which is my guilty pleasure, and no, I will not be shamed for it, how else am I going to know what Timothy Chalamet's Starbucks order is? But if you've been keeping up with Dumois or other celebrity gossip sites, you've probably heard of how Ozempic has been infiltrating Hollywood. For those of you who don't know, Ozempic is a medication. It is a prescription drug used to treat type 2 diabetes, and it contains a semaglutide, which manages blood glucose and prevents dangerous complications. However, one of the main side effects is that it can lead to a weight loss of up to 14.9%, which has convinced a lot of people who don't have diabetes to get the medication specifically to shed a couple pounds. Wegovy, which is another semaglutide, is another very popular um, weight loss mechanism around celebrity circles. Elon Musk in October 2022 even tweeted that the secret to his weight loss was fasting and Wegovy. There are some differences between the two. Um, Wegovy is a higher dosed version of Ozempic and is used specifically to treat weight loss, whereas Ozempic has been approved for type 2 diabetes treatment only. So to qualify for Wegovy, you have to be at a certain BMI, which I know is like a flawed system, but still you have to be a certain BMI. That's what it is now. Um, the problem is that it's easy to work around that if you just go to a shady med spa or telehealth service. The prices are also notably different. So without insurance, Wegovy is about $1,400 a month and Ozempic is about $900 a month. I don't know about Wegovy, but I do know that for Ozempic, because it's used to treat a chronic condition, you're supposed to like never stop using it. So yeah, that racks up in price. But because we're talking about a certain demographic of people, Ozempic has been considered the more affordable weight loss option. Um, and consequently, this has led to an increased demand for the prescription medication. On TikTok, there was actually a viral trend called hashtag Ozempic challenge, where people shared their weight loss results, which inevitably led to a surge in usage. This increased demand, as well as supply chain issues, has called a shortage of the medication. Unfortunately, um, because of the shortage, people who are actually diabetic are not getting this prescription medication to help them regulate their blood sugar. And so they're being forced to seek out other alternatives. And if you live in America, you know how messy the healthcare system is and how much red tape you have to swim through. So no, it's not really fair for people who actually need this for their lives 
to suffer just because some rich people want to lose 10 pounds in time for a Met Gala. Another problem is that like every prescription medication, there are side effects. And for Ozempic, it's mostly gastrointestinal side effects that can range from nausea and vomiting to pancreatitis and kidney problems. But the problem is if you're not getting prescribed this medication by a responsible and knowledgeable doctor, which you probably wouldn't be if you're getting prescribed it just for weight loss reasons, you're not gonna have this like professional assistance in monitoring these side effects. I think we like also need a reality check that there's only a certain number of people who are actually able to get Ozempic because of the high costs um, out of pocket. But that population is celebrities and influencers who do have a major influence on just trends overall. Vice reported that California-based medical professionals insist everyone is on it, despite no one in Hollywood openly talking about it, as far as I know, other than Elon Musk, I guess. <laughs> But even if these people are not like outwardly expressing how they're doing it, they're still losing weight. And I think when so many of these rich and famous, beautiful people are losing weight, it creates this narrative that thin is chic and we should all aspire to be that. Similar to Hero Chic, I think there is a particular subgroup um, known as girl bloggers and femcells who promote a waif thinness that is a reaction against the hashtag that girl toned thinness. The difference is, you know, the waif thinness is really about like looking <laughs> more emaciated, under eye bags, s hollow cheekbones, um, definitely like the hero chic type of thinness versus the that girl thinness is more like, oh, we just do Pilates every morning. We work out five times a day and we eat really well and that's why we're thin, but we're still like healthy. I made a video on girl bloggers and fem cells earlier this year, and so I don't really want to go into it again. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go click on that video. But in general, the girl bloggers aesthetic self-destruction is a rejection of millennial girl boss wellness culture. Thus, the 2020s depictions of matcha lattes, bullet journals, and crisp white linens feel reminiscent of Vogue's Brooke Shields fitness propaganda of the 1980s. And like Hero Chic, the desire to portray the uglier parts, cigarettes, unposed pictures on Instagram, and hashtag be real attempt to display the unfiltered reality most of us are actually living. Mm, nah. Yeah. No. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Definitely not. Oh yeah. Ugh. Yeah. June photo dump. Goals. <laughs> I don't know if it's too soon to say, but I definitely feel like, at least what the algorithm shows me, that Instagram and TikTok are becoming these visual diaries that Tumblr used to be in 2013. Once again, I think it's okay when you're doing it on a personal level, but I do raise an eyebrow um, when I see corporations trying to get in on this trend. For instance, skincare brands like Bad Habit Beauty and 4AM use Indie Sleaze Party Girl Marketing, even though their products still revolve around wellness. I'm sorry, but no amount of dirty martinis or flashy film photos in your campaigns is going to make a moisturizing serum anything less than a moisturizing serum. Let's call a spade a spade. The other more major problem of skinny exposure on social media is that days reported how ED online support groups have had a documented significant rise in members in that in January 2022, UK eating disorder charity Beat provided the highest number of support sessions for people affected by EDs in a single month in its history, a 7% increase from the same time period last year. I do want to say though that there can be some data discrepancies because I think as we become more technologically dependent, resources become more accessible on the internet. Like, and there probably were a lot of people in the 2000s and the 90s who had EDs and who just suffered in silence because these online support groups weren't available. So it's hard to say whether or not there's actually been an increase. I'm not like completely denying the fact that, uh, being exposed to certain imagery can be really triggering. 25-year-old Holly told Days that lockdown and the reintroduction of Y2K were big triggers for her friends. Especially the celebration of thinness and using thinness as an accessory, TikTok's algorithm has been showing her skinny, predominantly white girls eating the equivalent of a toddler's diet for months. 
Over the past year, journalists have also been scrutinizing a TikTok trend known as body checking. It's essentially a trend where someone flexes their body or a certain feature of their body. For example, if you peruse the hashtags jawline check, small waist, and side profile, these all have hundreds of millions of views. I don't think it's necessarily like a negative thing, like always to be proud of a feature of your body and I guess want to show people, but I think that hyper fixating on any part of your body for a long term can be very dangerous because bodies change naturally. So if you're flexing your hashtag small waist, which I think is probably the worst one of those three, one day you might wake up bloated and you might be reaching for your phone to make this content and you're like, I can't make this content, I'm bloated. It can open this Pandora's box of self-deprecating talk. So yeah, I don't think it's a good trend overall. A spokesperson for Beat even said, this is very concerning as we know that details about specific weights, dress sizes, calories, and exercise can serve as inspiration for those affected by EDs to engage in harmful behaviors and become more unwell. At the same time, I know I've like spent this entire video kind of shitting on how skinny culture is ruining lives and leading to societal detriment. I also think, I also want to warn against mass hysteria because... If you really think about it, skinny has always been in. Jessica Gross wrote for the New York Times, it's clear to me and to anyone who's been studying teen and tween girls over the past few decades that the super thin ideal never really went away, no matter the rise of the jeans the Hadid sisters happen to be wearing. And the insidious nature of that ideal has been pretty constant since the 90s or has possibly become worse. A review of studies published from 2000 to 2018 found that the prevalence of EDs increased over the study period from 3.5% for the 2000 to 2006 period to 7.8% for the 2013 to 2018 period. Again, I do wanna draw attention to the fact that a lot of times EDs are underreported, so it may just seem like it's increasing because more people are coming forward about it because dialogue and discussions about EDs have become more prominent in the culture. I don't know, that's, that's just a possibility. And also something that I think is happening right now is there's, there's a lot more awareness of anti-fat bias in the media. And I think body shaming is way more frowned upon. Like you couldn't get away with making fat jokes anymore for good reason. Like that's a positive thing. But, you know, compared to the 2000s, if you said anything like what you would see in those TV shows, like it's you're done. You're done. Rightfully so. But if we're going to be really honest, despite these changes in discussions, um, not much has actually happened. Like the past decade has not been as body positive as some of these journalists are making it seem. The fashion industry has always operated a tokenism of fat bodies. Case in point, Paloma Assessor wore the famous Miu Miu miniskirt in a shoot, but the brand doesn't actually sell her size. It was a custom made specifically for the shoot. And as I mentioned with, you know, Made Well and Reformation, they do have these plus size clothes. I don't know where they are because they're not in the store. They make it really inaccessible. They really show how they deprioritize their fat customers because, you know, if you go into the store, they have the full maximum range for straight sizes. And even though some people like to tout the whole like slim thick is uh, going against the grain and offering a new type of body uh, to enter the limelight, it's... Is it still really positive though? It's still championing a very difficult silhouette that only a certain number of people are actually naturally born with. Other people who want to be part of this have to get BBLs or implants, which are very dangerous procedures. And still, Slim Thick is about having like a relatively flat stomach. So in the end, I don't think it's any more achievable than a waif thin body type. The 2010s body positivity tried to be about this self-love, but it's so hard to do and it didn't acknowledge the fact that corporations, all types of industries are working against you. It's working to promote a negative self-image so that they can profit off of your insecurities to sell things. So when there are entire systems that have been in place for years and years working against you, some random comment that Kate Moss made feels like the least offending player. So thank you all for watching. Please let me know in the comments what you think about this topic and whether you think that thin is on the rise or if you think it never left and what you think is going to be the future for the body positivity movement. I hope you have a lovely rest of your holiday season and I'll see you in the new year. Have a good one. Bye.